Good morning, everyone. Uh, we want to welcome you to our briefing on the end of session summer recess briefing on priority legislation. Appreciate you taking some time this morning as we walk through uh, what legislation is of importance to cities uh, for you to consider if you want to go and weigh in on with your uh, legislators. So I want to go through the agenda really quick and give you just a quick overview of where we are with the legislative schedule and then we will turn it over to our great team. So for our agenda, we'll do a quick introduction and overview, and then we'll have each of the lobbyists walk through their issue areas and bills of importance within those areas. So there will be an opportunity for questions throughout, um, and that we'll go in there's specific timings that we'll stop to make sure that we are uh, answering your questions. So really quick, just some housekeeping notes. If you are planning on speaking today, please make sure your audio is connected and you should be prompted to connect your audio when joining the webinar, but you can confirm by collecting the audio setting on your toolbar. All attendees are muted and this webinar is being recorded. For asking a question, if you're verbally asking a question or making a comment, use the raise hand feature on the toolbar at the bottom of the screen once the Q&A portion begins. You'll be called on and unmuted. To write in a question, select the Q&A button on your toolbar. You can also upvote other attendees' questions if you, have, if you are interested in hearing the answer. So really quick, just want to show you who is on the team and who you will be hearing from today. Here is our League Legislative team, and I apologize, I should have introduced myself. I am Melanie Perrin. I'm the Deputy Executive Director for the League. We'll have Derek Dolphy, Charles Harvey, Jason Rhine, Bijan Mariar, Nick Romo speaking, and additionally, we'll also have Johnny um, Pina and Carolyn, and I'm going to not get her last name right, so I'm not going to say it, so I apologize. Um, and then we also have Meg Desmond on this uh, webinar. So really quick, I just want to give you an overview of where we are on the legislative session. So as we start the year off, um, back in January, the League had five priority positions or strategic priorities. Um, and we were coming in with a flush budget for the state. The governor proposed a 20, uh, $222 billion budget proposal, but which meant a budget surplus of over $5 billion. Uh, when we got to March, that's when COVID hit the state very hard and the legislature had had minimal involvement, um, had to shut down basically and take a very extended recess and had minimal involvement in emergency response um, during that time. So that left the governor with uh, taking a lot of executive actions to go and ensure that the state cities um, could make sure that we could continue operating. Um, and then in May is when the governor released his May revise, which was a, a toned down budget from the $222 billion, um, leaving us with $203 billion as his projected budget. So just to give you an overview of the legislative year, what we thought we were starting with and where we ended up, um, the legislature introduced approximately 2,500 bills at the beginning of this year, many of importance to cities. Uh, through the process with COVID-19, the legislature has really focused its priorities in key areas. So focusing on COVID-19 response, uh, they still are, homelessness and um, housing is still a priority, along with disaster relief. And now with all the civil unrest that has been occurring, public safety has also become a big issue for the legislature. So the legislature has whittled down its bills from those 200, the 2,500 mark to about probably around less than 500 at this point. So this is a very unusual year of engagement for us where we would have significant amount of hot bills and priority bills. Um, the, the full picture for us, it's not as much as we would have been doing in previous years, but we have been focused significantly on budget negotiations, uh, working to make sure that we are getting cities the $7 billion plus needed for revenue loss. Um, the legislature did pass a budget last week and the governor did sign it on uh, Monday. Uh, and it provides 500 million for cities uh, through the CARES Act dollars that came into the state. That is to be used for COVID-19 related purposes. We have sent out that information through the regional manager, so you should be getting that information of how those dollars can be expended and how much your city should be expecting to get. There's other dollars that did come in through the budget regarding homelessness, um, housing, and other components. So with that, just kind of setting the stage of where we had started the year and where we are now, um, the legislature, the assembly did go on recess starting last Thursday, excuse me, two weeks ago, um, and then they'll be coming back on July 13th. 
The Senate will begin its recess this Thursday and will also come back July 13th. This is not a typical schedule for us. Uh, we typically have the, both houses in alignment on schedule and have a month off in the period of around July for their summer recess. Because the legislature took such an extended recess earlier this year, they've, gone, they've truncated their summer recess, putting a lot more time on the back end, um, approximately six to seven weeks, for them to finalize all their legislation to get it to the governor's desk by the uh, deadline of August 31st. So that's why it's really important for us to give you an update today of where we are legislatively, um, what legislation you may be interested in and contacting your legislator on, um, as we are now in the final push to uh, provide our analysis if we have bills of concern or bills that we love. So with that, I would like to go and uh, hand this over to Derek Dolphy, who will present on community services, and then we'll also then go into environmental quality. Thanks, Melanie. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well um, this fine morning. Um, as Melanie mentioned, my name is Derek Dolphy. I am both the community services and environmental quality lobbyist here for the League of California City. He's going to touch on a number of bills in both issue areas. So we're going to hop right in. Next slide, please. Um, so the first bill I'd like to talk about it, on the community resiliency and disaster preparedness space is AB 2213 by Assemblymember Lamone. This bill essentially would require the California Office of, of Emergency Services, also known as Cal OES, to develop model guidelines for local governments and other entities um, to track different community resources that are available to assist local governments in responding to and recovering from disasters. So this bill really comes out of the gap in information about local governments understanding what resources they have both in the nonprofit and faith-based and other um, community-based organizations where when it comes to um, accessing uh, food, for example, you know, what type of uh, nonprofit food banks are in your area, um, what types of shelter beds are available in case of an earthquake or a natural disaster of some kind. So this is really just trying to bridge that gap between some local governments that might need some uh, uh, what might want to look to some model guidelines to how they can kind of build that that grassroots network and then having um, their California Office of Emergency Services kind of come up with those guidelines um, to make sure that the state has a uniform kind of floor when it comes to coordinating these community resources. And we do have a support position on that bill and that bill has crossed houses is now waiting at the Senate desk for referral. Next slide. So this next bill is also in the same space of community resiliency and disaster preparedness. This is SB 1196 by Senator Umberg related to price gouging. Obviously don't need to tell any of you how the beginning of the pandemic in uh, March and April, certain items were flying off the shelves and you could find them online for uh, the absorbent prices as well as in some um, not reputable commercial retail organizations. So this bill is trying to say that um, you cannot uh, charge a price greater than 50% um, immediately before or prior to the proclamation or de declaration of an emergency. This really bore out of when different counties were closing down at different times where you could have one county that was totally locked down with a stay at home order and the county next door not be locked down. And of course, some businesses took advantage of that by raising their prices because there wasn't a disaster declared in that county, but there was in the adjacent county. So this is trying to kind of rein in those bad actors and make sure that we extend the existing price gouging protections that we have um, to things related to the pandemic. And so we have a watch position on that. And I believe this bill is awaiting referral in the assembly now as well. Next slide, please. So moving away for a moment um, from the community resiliency and disaster preparedness space and into parks and recreation, um, I do want to uh, co-introduce uh, this bill with our revenue and taxation lobbyist, uh, Mr. Nick Romo, who will say a couple words uh, at the end of my presentation uh, from the fiscal side and the revenue side of this bill. But this bill is a gut and amend by Senator Portantino related to recreational and organizational camps. And the main thing that this bill does is it really requires a, a very robust, almost holistic over overhaul of the uh, organized camp and recreational camp system in California. Um, it does a number of things. I won't touch on all of them. You can see them there. Um, but I, uh, I think what's notable to us is we're still unclear if this bill applies to city day camps and recreational camps. That's something we're looking into, something we're trying to get clarity from from the author's office, because the way that it's uh, defined in the bill, they switch back and forth between organized camp and recreational camp, and there's really not a clear definition of if that includes like municipally run or publicly run 
day in summer camp. So we're trying to figure that out, as well as we want to see what the real appetite for such an overhaul in this area is right now, given the short and condensed timeline with the legislature. As Melanie mentioned, they were out on recess for several months, and now bills are still continued to be um, culled down to just the most essential. We will see if this bill um, does have appetite. I know it's been uh, recently referred to the Assembly Health Committee, so we'll need to engage there. And if you have any comments or questions on the parks and recreation side of how this will impact your city, please let me know. I'm trying to gather some more feedback from our membership to really understand what the impacts of this bill might be. But it is a hefty bill. I believe it's almost 70 pages long. So uh, settle in and, and get ready for that one uh, if you do want to read that. So with that, I'll kick it over to Nick to share some of his fiscal and revenue side of this bill. Nick, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Derek, and good morning, everybody. Uh, again, Nick Romo, I'm your revenue and taxation lobbyist here with the league. Uh, on 217, uh, I just wanted to highlight for the folks that um, are, are, are more inclined with the, uh, the fiscal aspects of our, of our, of our operations. Um, it does require a significant amount of new, uh, essentially work uh, for cities to inspect, um, to fine, to penalize, uh, and to uh, assess a fee against uh, these sort of new nonprofit camps. And so uh, whenever some of these bills come through, we have to really do a cost benefit analysis of, you know, what fees are we bringing in, um, how are those fees going to be structured, and what new mandates are going to be uh, placed on us to um, ensure the safety at these camps. We're also unclear whether or not this also will apply uh, to parks and rec programs, uh, our own parks and rec programs that we offer at city parks. So we're still looking at that. And just as Derek alluded to, you know, as the league is studying the impacts of COVID-19, uh, you know, nearly 85% of cities noted significant uh, hits to their parks and recreation programs, and that, that includes staff. And so uh, this comes at a time where we may uh, be less fit to uh, do some oversight uh, of these camps. And so I will be watching that, and I'll be bringing it to uh, our fiscal officers and finance directors um, uh, in the coming days. So thank you. Appreciate uh, your fiscal mind there, Nick, and thanks for your comments on this bill. So we do have a pending position on, as Nick and I both alluded to, we're still trying to gather and assess the full impacts that this legislation may have on cities. So if you have questions or comments or feedback, um, both on the Parks and Rec side as well as on the fiscal side, please do reach out to Nick or myself. Our contact information will, are uh, provided in these slides and you can find it on our website as well. Um, so moving on from this bill to our last bill in community services, um, which is in the tobacco, e-cigarettes, and vaping um, section, is SB 793 by Senator Hill related to flavored tobacco products. For those of you who are uh, monitoring this last year and this year, this has been a very contentious issue in the legislature. They tried and were unsuccessful last year in moving a bill through that would do something very similar. Senator Hill was spearheading that. He again reintroduced a very similar piece of legislation this year, which is SB 793, which has numerous um, co-authors, including I think about 30 uh, various legislators and the lieutenant governor. So it's a very heavily lobbied bill on both sides. Obviously, there's a uh, large tobacco interests at stake here as well. So what this bill essentially would do is prohibit a tobacco retailer from selling flavored tobacco products in, in general, um, and it would create a violation of $250 per violation. Um, it also recently, uh, in order to get out the Appropriations Policy Committee, took an exemption for shisha tobacco, which is used in hookah water pipes. So that was apparently a, a big point of contention. And so um, taking that amendment to exempt that specific use of tobacco has now kind of given it the momentum to move out of the Senate. And now it is re referred to the Assembly Health Committee. And so it'll be heard there where I imagine it will make it out of there and be sent to the assembly floor. So we do have a watch on it. We do have some policy in this area, but um, just want to make sure we flagged it for all of you in case your cities are uh, wanting to engage on that front. Uh, next slide, please. So moving away from community services, obviously, as Melanie uh, indicated at the beginning of this presentation, there weren't a lot of bills that were let, um, able to move forward this year because of the condensed timeline. Community services was one of those areas where the large universe of bills was definitely narrowed down to just a few. So those are really the four main bills that we're tracking right now in community services. However, there were a number of other bills introduced that were had, had to be sidelined because of COVID-19 and the compressed timelines. So now moving to environmental quality, uh, a whole number of bills here that I want to touch on. Next slide, please. So the first slide here is the California uh, Environmental Quality Act, CEQA. There's a number of bills related to CEQA this year. 
This one I want to draw your attention to, which is SB 3279 by Assemblywoman Friedman. Um, this is talking about administrative and judicial procedures. Essentially what this bill will do would is it would reduce the deadline for a court to commence hearings from one year to 270 days. So kind of shortening that timeline as well as providing the lead agency may decide uh, whether a plaintiff prepares the administrative record, um, which we, I think uh, it's an interesting prospect. I know that amendments are coming on this bill to actually change that. So we'll have to put a pin in that and we can get a, uh, more of an update once those amendments are in print on that section. And then the last piece, which I think is something that is very important to us. And for those of you that have a lot of CEQA cases, um, it would authorize a court to issue an interlocutory remand order if certain findings are made. I know some of our attorneys have been very uh, reticent about this language, about trying to constrain the use of interlocutory remands and kind of putting findings on because we don't want to get sued or challenged over if these findings are made. So without getting into the weeds, a um, couple different things going on here on the CEQA bill and a number of other sequel bills coming on. So if you're active in this space or you have projects that um, are being held up by CEQA and you want to engage, please let me know and do check out this bill um, on CEQA. Next slide, please. So um, there's two different climate change resiliency bonds out there. They're pretty much all but dead for this year. There is a chance that they still might make it through, but um, for all intents and purposes, the momentum doesn't look like it's there for this year, but I do want to include them because technically they still have a shot of qualifying through the legislature and being placed on the November 2020 ballot. The first one I want to mention is AB 3256 by assembly member Eduardo Garcia, which is the economic recovery, wildfire prevention, safe drinking water, Drought Preparation or, uh, and Flood Protection Bond Act of 2020. It's essentially a $6.98 billion bond for those different programs. And like I said, um, it, right now it's in the Assembly Rules Committee. It would need to pass out of the Assembly and pass through the Senate um, to, in order to be placed onto the November 2020 ballot. Um, this bill, next slide please, is in conjunction with and kind of similar to SB 45, which is a similar bond measure, but obviously pared down by about two billion or one and a half billion dollars, which is Senator Allen or the Senate's vehicle for a climate bond, which is the wildfire prevention, safe drinking water, drought preparation, and flood protection bond act of 2020. This bond measure uh, is very similar. It doesn't have all the same pots of funding and it kind of moves money around in different ways, but overall the intent is similar that both Senator Allen and Assembly Member Eduardo Garcia are looking to place something on the ballot to kind of help out with the climate resiliency angle, climate change, addressing that, but also this uh, talking about economic stimulus and green stimulus to try and help some of California's businesses come back, giving them more money, injecting these dollars into the economy. But like I said, uh, the deadline, the normal course of action deadline was June 25th to place ballot measures on the ballot. However, the legislature does have the option to try to extend that out. I believe the deadline is sometime in July. So still a lot of hurdles for this bill and uh, um, AB 3256 to cross in order to be placed on the ballot. But do wanna you know, flag these for you that they're, we're both in support. And hopefully if this doesn't happen this year, it'll happen in the coming years as well. So, so some of our um, local government cities um, and counties are able to get this money to help out with the mitigation efforts for climate change. Next slide, please. Okay, so pivoting away from climate change and towards um, disaster and emergency preparation and response, which as Melanie mentioned was one of our strategic priorities this year. Um, we have AB 2178 by Assemblymember Levine having to do with emergency services. This measure um, amends the California Emergency Services Act to include de-energization as a defined um, uh, as defined like so a public power shut off um, as a condition constituting a local or state of emergency. This bill um, is in response to the widespread use of the utility initiated power shutoffs from October of last year. Those bills, or excuse me, those um, instances actually weren't considered an emergency because right now the California Emergency Services Act simply says it has to be an unplanned power outage, not a planned power outage. So this is just clarifying that and reiterating that local governments have the ability to um, call a state of emergency for a de-energization event, obviously with the large impacts that it has in our communities and um, how it can definitely cause a lot of havoc uh, when these things happen. So we're in support of that. This bill is being lobbied heavily by the investor on utilities. So um, if you are so inclined and your city has been one of those cities that unfortunately had a lot of these power shutdowns last year, would encourage you to take a look at that. And we do have a support position and that bill is now um, pending in the Senate. Next slide, please. 
Um, another bill related to this topic around electrical corporations and trying to hold them more accountable for turning off the power and kind of setting up a reimbursement system for local governments who have been negatively impacted by a power shutoff is SB 378 by Senator Weiner. This bill essentially requires electrical corporations, so we're talking about the major three investor-owned utilities, PG&E, SDG&E, SoCal Edison, to collect more data on their equipment and ensure that the cost of accrued by local governments and other customers during these utility initiated power shutoffs are actually recovered and recovered in a timely manner. So setting up that reimbursement schedule for us so we can actually say, hey, we had to, you know, buy X amount of power generator, backup power generators, or we had to do X amount of public safety over time to, you know, do evacuations, et cetera, trying to recoup some of those costs from the investor owned utilities for when they turn off the power. And also it would establish the civil penalty for um, the electrical corporation for every hour that they have the power shut off. Um, and, and so to really trying to make it so this is the last resort, not the first resort. So it's something where uh, they'll be incentivized to upgrade their infrastructure first and then turn off the power at the last um, instance. And last but not least, just kind of clarify that electrical corporations need to notify cities and counties as early as possible. So that way cities aren't finding out on the evening news or on Facebook or Twitter that the power is being shut off versus actually hearing it straight from the source. So we do have a support position on that. And that bill is just referred to the utility and energy committee in the assembly. Next slide, please. Um, SB 862 Dodd, this act, bill is actually similar in one regard to SB, or excuse me, AB 2178 by Levine, but does a couple of other things. Um, this measure amends the Emergency Services Act, just like 2178 did, to include de-energization events as, a state, as constituting a state of local and emergency, as well as it, it sets up a new procedure for electrical corporations to have to deal specifically with access and functional needs individuals, obviously very important for our folks in our community, so we're supportive of that. Coordinate with local governments to establish the community resource centers. Many of you reached out to the league and told us about how the uh, utilities were setting up these community resource centers uh, far away from town or in the middle of nowhere. It was just a tent and some chairs. So we want to make sure that when they do set up these community resource centers, they're coordinating with the appropriate city or county local government. So that way they're cited in the proper place with the proper resources. And then last but not at least it uh, per makes utility companies perform necessary electrical upgrades to ensure that mobile backup power generators can be located at community resource centers. So making sure that not only do they have these resource centers, but they have appropriate backup power there as well. So that way we can charge people's phones, keep um, medicines and food cold, keep people cool from the hot temperature temperatures, things like that. So we're very supportive of this bill. Um, and it's also been referred to the Assembly Utilities and Energy Committee, and we have a support position on that. Next slide, please. Um, SB 1099, this bill I'm actually going to talk with in conjunction with the next bill, which is SB 1185 by Senator Morlock, but SB 1099 by Dodd, essentially this is trying to get at an instance where if the power is turned off in a critical facility, so like a water uh, pumping station, a sewage treatment plant, et cetera, needs to run a backup power generator, if a local air quality management district has uh, time limits on how long you can run a backup generator, this would essentially uh, make all local air districts develop what's, what's called stipulations for orders of abatement that will allow permanent uh, facilities to use backup power generators to exceed limits um, if one of those facilities does need to enter into one of these stipulated orders of abatement in order to continue to run their generator during a power shutoff event. But the thing that is interesting for us and something we need to dig our, our teeth into a little bit more is uh, as part of these SOAs, these stipulated orders of abatement, they would have to include, as condition of um, entering into one of these, the local agency would have to include a reporting of uh, the use and condition of the backup power generator and a schedule for replacing older polluting generators with the cleanest, feasible, most applicable technology that is economically feasible. So obviously this is something where um, we hope that this isn't super onerous on our local ju jurisdictions, uh, something we're digging into more but definitely working on this bill and working with Senator Dodd has been really good to us. So hopefully we can try and work through some of these questions that we have on the bill. So we do have a pending position on that. Next slide, please. 
SB 1185 by Morlock does something very similar. Uh, we do have an opposed position on this bill. Our letter is pending on it though, but we have been in touch with the author's office about uh, our opposition. So this uh, essentially does something similar where it, were, it would require a facility permittee um, when applying for emergency variance, so different than a, a stipulated order of abatement, but emergency variance for a backup power generator, uh, they would have to demonstrate that they're using the cleanest feasible available backup power source possible um, including but not limited national natural gas power generators. So essentially saying if you want to run if you want to enter into emergency variance, which we can do right now without any stipulations, this would say in order to enter into this emergency variance for a backup power generator, you have to demonstrate that you have the cleanest powerable, cleanest feasible power a backup power source there is. And so obviously at a time when city budgets are really constrained, we care about air quality, but we also don't wanna make it super onerous for our folks to continue our critical operations like sewer treatment, water pumping, public safety, emergency operations, those types of things. We wanna make sure that those operations do not cease during a power shutoff. So we wanna make sure that this isn't a mandate for us to have to go out and buy very expensive power generators. And so we are opposed to that bill. Uh, next slide, please. Um, quickly, I'll just touch on um, SB 350. This is the bill of Senator Hill. It was just signed into law last night by, uh, by the governor. It essentially creates a public not-for-profit not benefit corporation called the Golden State Energy Corporation that would acquire PG&E if PG&E 1 does not emerge from Chapter 11 bankruptcy, which uh, uh, we are anticipating they will, or two, uh, if the CPUC decides to revoke their license. This bill has actually created an entire entity in law that will step in to take over for pg e if they mess up a third time, essentially. So this is a fail-safe plan. Um, we're not anticipating that we'll need to use this bill anytime soon, but if and when pg e enters into bankruptcy again, or the PUC decides that they uh, no longer want to have their license uh, to, to um, supply power in the state of California, this Golden State Energy Corporation will kick in and uh, will be stood up uh, in the state of California. Next slide, please. Um, in energy and utilities, and we're, we're burning through these, so I'm almost done here. So thank you all for very much for bearing with me. I know we got a lot of slides on, on this, but there's a lot of stuff going on in the, in the energy and utility space this year. Um, SB 1312 by Senator McGuire. This bill does a number of things, um, but for those of you who are very interested and engaged on the undergrounding proceeding at the CPUC around Rule 20, this bill actually does um, require that the CPUC revise the Rule 20 tariff program to include undergrounding electric lines in high fire threat areas. So this is something that we had an annual conference resolution on last year, something that we've been, we have new existing policy on, something we're very engaged with. So we're very happy to see that included in the bill. Um, so we're supporting it for that reason, as well as it does direct the CPUC to oversee various investor-owned utility efforts uh, by putting new requirements on specific reporting, the ability to assess fines and penalties, notification requirements, and actually requiring in statute a certain kind of ratcheting up of identifying the 15% most critical infrastructure that's at risk, and then a schedule for um, over the next, uh, I believe it's eight years, actually uh, fixing all 15% of that most critically identified infrastructure to make sure it's upgraded, it's safe, and we don't have a repeat of what happened in the town of Paradise. Um, so we have a, a support position on that. Uh, if you're engaged in this uh, space as well, uh, would love your support on that bill uh, to help out Senator McGuire. Next slide, please. Very quickly on solid waste and recycling, um, AB 1672 by Bloom. It's a bill that's sponsored by the California Association of Sanitation Agencies, as well as um, some other solid waste organizations, trying to make sure that we label, uh, have labeling requirements for products that shouldn't be flushed down the toilet, uh, and including non-woven disposable products. Obviously, when these flushable wipes that aren't actually flushable get flushed down the toilet, it causes uh, backups in our sewers and in our uh, waste treatment plants that are very costly for local governments. It causes sewage to back up into the street and a lot of uh, cost overruns. So this bill uh, was been working on for the last year and a half. We just heard that this bill it has a deal with the um, industry that actually sells these. So we are gonna be supporting this bill uh, once we see the new bill in print and hope all of you can support it as well. Um, so stay tuned for our letter on that. Next slide, please. Um, 
SB 54, AB 1080 by Assemblymembers Allen and Assemblywoman Gonzalez. I'm not going to go into this bill. It's something we talked a lot about last year. They're still out there. It's trying to reduce the amount of single-use plastics and packaging that enter into the waste stream to help us out on the back end so we don't have to deal with the volume of these products and make it so our bales of of uh, recyclable material or cleaner. Um, the bills are still both sitting on the floor of their second house right at the finish line. Not sure if these bills will continue to move forward this year or, or make it across the finish line, but it's still out there. We're still supportive and hopefully um, we'll see if these bills move forward or not this year. Next slide, please. Okay, so our last slide here uh, before I will kick it over um, or excuse me, before um, I give it over to Bijan for our governance, transparency, and labor relations, is I want to talk very briefly about water quality, SB 1044 by Senator Allen. This is about firefighting equipment and foam and PFAS in that foam. Obviously, as many of you know, PFAS is a contaminant that gets into our groundwater that's found in a lot of plastic products. Um, and then we as local governments often are tasked with cleaning up that groundwater and making it safe for our residents to drink and for our crops and our irrigation. So this bill essentially would prohibit the use of firefighting foam that contain these PFAS chemicals, except we're federally required and would require a notification for the presence of PFAS in these um, equipment for firefighters knowledge. So this is sponsored by the California Professional Firefighters uh, and also supported by the California Fire Chiefs. And so we're supporting it. We think it makes sense. Um, it's not meant to curtail the, the use or the uh, effectiveness of firefighters and their uh, firefighting foam, but just meant to uh, switch away from a chemical or from a product that contains a chemical that's very harmful for the water and harmful for the environment to something that's a little bit better um, and not as uh, destructive. And so we do have a support position on that bill as well. That bill has just been referred to the Assembly um, Environmental Safety and Toxic Materials Policy Committee. Uh, and so if you'd like to engage there, uh, we will have a sample letter up for that bill very shortly. Next slide, please. And with that, um, thank you all very much. Uh, we are taking questions in the Q&A. So when we get to that section, um, we will uh, address that. And with that, I'm gonna kick it over to our wonderful governance, transparency, and labor relations lobbyist, Mr. Bijan Mariar. Take it away. Thank you so much, Derek. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Bijan Mariar, and I'm your governance, transparency, and labor relations lobbyist. And today we're gonna to run through some of the important bills that you all should be aware of that are important in this space. Next slide, please. So the first bill I want to discuss is AB 664. This bill is the main vehicle for um, the majority of public sector workers to gain workers' compensation protections given the COVID-19 pandemic. So obviously we recognize that our public safety employees have been on the front lines and have been incredibly responsive to the needs of their communities. However, we also recognize that there's a very important fiscal balancing act that we have to maintain in terms of how do we protect those workers and keep them whole while also maintaining um, our, our fiscal strength to continue weathering the storm that is the pandemic itself, but also the pandemic induced recession. Our particular challenge with workers' compensation right now broadly is that while we want to make sure that workers who do contact COVID-19 during the course of their activities are able to access workers' compensation, they need to do so in a controlled way. And we need to make sure we're not building in uh, payments or different types of compensation that go beyond the traditional workers' compensation system. So for instance, this bill also includes payments to quarantine or for housing or other costs that we traditionally wouldn't cover. And I would, and I will also add that we're in very much uncharted territory because it's a very novel concept to include a communicable disease like COVID-19 within workers' compensation, where the injuries that are usually compensated for are of an entirely different nature. So we've taken a watch position on this. We're continuing to engage with other stakeholders along with uh, both having discussions with labor and also the legislature and the administration on what a statutory change to the workers' compensation system related to COVID-19 would look like. And so for now, we have a watch on this bill. There is a second bill. If we go to the next slide, please. This bill, SB 1159, which is another bill that attempts to codify um, workers' compensation protections tied to the governor's executive order. We think this vehicle is a much more appropriate and is, is on a trajectory to be a much more moderate compromise for what we need to change in workers' compensation to account 
for COVID-19. To be clear, the previous bill was the introduced version of what la the labor organizations would like to see. This bill, uh, the authors have been much more engaging with us on the dialogue of how we can do something in workers' compensation, but also make sure that public agencies are not inundated with compensation claims that make, ma that make managing their finances all that more difficult. So we are part of a coalition of public and private employers that have been issuing um, concern letters and working with the authors in terms of crafting what should this workers' compensation change look like in the future. Next slide, please. Uh, this is one measure that we are supporting, AB 2473 for public investment funds. Uh, as many of you have seen, CalPERS has really begun to diversify its strategies, recognizing that the need to hit its 7% investment return target is so much more important, especially in light of the investment challenges that they faced just over the last couple of months because of the recession. This measure would exclude from the California Public Records Act certain documents that are related to uh, private debt deals that CalPERS might issue themselves. So for instance, if CalPERS wants to make a loan themselves out of the fund uh, to fund certain investments in the hopes of reaping that investment return, it would make sure that certain types of those documents are protected from the California Public Records Act to make sure that competitors who want to be seeking similar deals wouldn't be able to sabotage them with a CPRA request and would also make sure that certain fiduciary information that is privileged for those companies and in, in private business would be protected from the CPRA. So we're supporting this bill as part of our holistic effort to support the work of the CalPERS Investment Office. I do realize that, that many of you have concerns about CalPERS engaging in a new investment strategy that could potentially increase the risk that the fund takes. And we've been working with CalPERS on explaining what that new portfolio strategy looks like and how they are gonna be hedging against potential losses. So next slide, please. Uh, AB 2999 is a bill by Assemblymember Lowe uh, that has to do with bereavement leave. Uh, we are opposed to this bill uh, because we have decided as an organization that we are going to oppose labor mandates uh, on our public agencies at a time of increasing shrink increasingly shrinking resources. We think this is important because a lot of these leave components can be negotiated and bargained at the local level, but also Given that as part of the federal CARES Act, public agencies were not able to pay for their two weeks of paid sick leave that they had to provide to employees, unlike how private employers were able to receive a social security tax credit, we think that continuing to layer unfunded mandates at the state level on top of what you already have to manage at the federal level does not make sense again during this time of fiscal duress. We do believe that this measure is going to be amended to change it to 10 unpaid days to three paid days, but we will still continue to oppose the legislation. While we do recognize that, you know, there are circumstances where employers have to make decisions about giving leave that might be out of the ordinary or outside of the confines of an MOU, we still think those decisions are best left at the local level and should not be guided by mandates from Sacramento. Next bill, please. AB 3216 is a similar bill that would provide 12 work, week, 12 work weeks of unpaid leave uh, for authorization for families. And this bill is just similar to the last one, another expansive leave mandate. And it would make it increasingly difficult for you all, all of, with some cities already making decisions to furlough and lay off staff, to manage their workload and to manage the need to deliver critical services if you are continuing to provide more and more opportunities for employees to take leave. Because while we know that them taking unpaid leave doesn't have an immediate fiscal effect, there is still the fact that work has to be done at the agency level and in the field, and this creates an impediment to that work being done, which makes it much more difficult for you all to manage your workload with limited resources. In addition to that, it would also provide a private right of action for not providing the leave, which could expose all of you to litigation costs. So we are working very closely with the private employers on opposing this measure as well. Next bill, please. SB 1173 uh, is another labor relations bill. Uh, currently, uh, as employers, you all are required to make certain pieces of information available to your bargaining units and to your and to the organizations that represent those bargaining units 
this measure would, would declare it to be an unfair labor practice for you all to, if there was a mistake in the information that's provided and would not give you an opportunity to cure it. So we think it's problematic that information lapses would end up being penalized before um, the Public Employment Relations Board. So we're opposing this measure with the other public employers. We again think that this is unreasonable that for a lack of, for a lack of including certain information or for certain mistake to be made, that you all would have to be penalized for it. Next slide, please. Uh, happy to take any questions. Um, with that, I will turn it over to another one of my colleagues. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. This is Jason Ryan, um, your Housing Community Economic Development Lobbyist. I think we're gonna go ahead and take some questions now. We've been at it for about 45 minutes-ish. So um, I do see a couple questions in the Q&A uh, area. If you would like to raise your hand and ask a question, we can certainly unmute you. Um, it looks like the first question really is for Derek. Um, Derek, do you see the question in the Q&A? Would you like me to read it or do you, do you see it? Uh, go ahead and read it, yeah. Okay, there's a specific question about, you know, whether the league has a position on AB 1567 by Aguilar Curry that deals with organic waste scoping plans. So, Derek? Yes, thank you for the question. So the league currently has a watch position on 1567. This was a bill uh, that's a two-year bill from last year. Uh, right now I'm looking at it and it looks like it been, it's, it's sitting in the Senate Natural Resources and Water Policy Committee. Um, it's something that we're monitoring closely. We're, I don't think we're going to weigh in on it just yet um, or if at all, because it's essentially a bill that's trying to create or trying to give the Strategic Growth Council kind of uh, the idea to, you know, look at a scoping plan for organic waste and whatnot. And I'm, I just don't understand and don't know um, how much that will really change anything. So while we think it's a good intention bill, I'm not sure if it's something that we'll be weighing in on just yet. Um, but if you and, and your city specifically has thoughts, more than happy for you to send me an email and uh, hear what your thoughts are on the bill. Excellent, thanks, Derek. And yeah, again, if you have any other questions, you know, please type them into the Q&A uh, section or you can raise your hands. Um, I just checked the, the participants, I don't see, any hands raised at this time. So um, if, if there aren't any questions, we'll certainly move along and, and we'll take, take questions uh, as we go. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and jump into housing, community and economic development. Um, you know, this year housing has been just uh, really different. I mean, much like our other, other areas, when the year started, we had lots and lots of bills. Some bills were, were really, you know, detrimental to local government. Um, I think the story for this year so far is really what is what didn't make it more than what's made it so far. Um, the mitigation fee act bills were all tabled, um, which is a really big deal. They were going to significantly curtail how we're able to charge fees to mitigate for a project's development. Bills that were seeking to to build, you know, five and seven story buildings throughout our communities, those were really all tabled in January. Uh, and now we have um, a much more modest approach to to housing, something we haven't seen in the last three years. Um, so it's a little bit uh, refreshing to see that there's a little bit of a different, you know, paradigm that we're kind of working in. That's not going to last, I'm sure. I mean, this year has really been impacted by COVID. So um, while this year may not be, uh, you know, as a big year for housing, I think we're certainly going to see it continue in the coming years um, because, you know, we are going to see a, a drop off in permits. We're going to see a drop off in construction. We've already started to see it. So there's going to be a lot of emphasis, I believe, at the legislature um, you know, throughout this year and the coming years to focus more on local government. Um, but I definitely want to highlight a handful of bills. And if we could go to the next slide, I'm going to touch on two bills um, that are two-year bills. These are, these are leftovers essentially from last year that are technically still alive. I'm, I'm not so sure that either one of them are going to move, but the first one here is AB 1279. This deals with high resource areas. Um, it's a bill by Assembly Member Bloom. Again, it's over in the Senate Housing Committee. Um, this is kind of a leftover from SB 50. It's similar to that, um, but, but, but different. Um, and, and it's unclear whether this bill is gonna get heard. It didn't get heard last year. Um, there's a big disagreement whether or not it's gonna get heard this year. We, we're keeping a very close eye on it. I mean, I, if the bill does get set for committee, um, we're certainly gonna put in an opposition letter um, since it does go way beyond what um, the league's housing proposal is. And it goes way beyond some of the other bills um, that we're going to talk about in a minute that have really focused yeah. more on the creation of, of duplexes, um, not so much on uh, somebody one tomorrow. Uh, it's just like a Bijan, a Bijan, the membership about where we are with like, here, hang on one second. We're going to put Bijan on mute here. To present. I'm wearing a... Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Bijan forgot to take himself off of, uh, uh, put himself on mute. Um, okay, so 1279, 
Not sure if it's going to move. Again, if it does move, then we are certainly going to put an opposition letter because it's looking to create up to 100 units per acre in our commercial zones and mandate fourplexes and single family zones. Again, this goes beyond really where I think the legislature is at right now, um, but I, I'm not so sure it's going to move. The other bill we see here is 1484 by Assemblymember Grayson. This was one of the big mitigation fee act bills. This completely upends how we charge mitigation fees. Um, we are adamantly opposed to this bill. I'm not so sure it's going to move. If it does get set for committee, then we'll let everybody know. And we're going to take very aggressive action on this bill. Um, but, I, but I think it's going to probably stall out because all of the other mitigation fee act bills were held in committee. I, I'd be a little surprised if this one gets the green light, given the economic situation that our cities are under. Next slide. Okay, now we're going to talk about a couple bills regarding density bonus law. I mean, density bonus law is a pretty complex law, um, but at the heart of density bonus law, it's been around for about 40 years. It, it really is a law that, that tries to get developers to develop low, very low senior housing, you know, low income housing. Um, it, it's a way for uh, developers to receive incentives and concessions at the local level. So it requires cities and counties to give, you know, concessions and, and relief from various zoning standards. It could be setback requirements. It could be parking requirements. It could be a whole host of things that we charge or require as part of conditioning a development. Um, this law basically uh, limits those, gives the developer waivers from those to save the developer money so the developer can take that money to then build affordable housing. Um, that's essentially what density bonus law does. It's quite confusing and there's lots of, you know, carve outs and, and the other things, but these two bills look to increase the number of incentives that cities and counties are required to provide to developers in exchange for that affordable housing. Now you can see that we have opposed unless amended positions on both of these. They went through our policy committee, went to our board of directors, and basically the league's position on these are, you know, we can't give away too many things uh, to developers because then there's really nothing left. And if we are gonna have to give away more stuff, we've gotta make sure that it actually translates into affordable housing. And in the case of uh, SB 1085, it's moderate income rental housing. So um, we wanna make sure that there's the right balance. Um, because as we all know, our city is under great pressure to make sure that low, very low and moderate income housing is actually constructed. So we need to make sure that the low and very low in particular, that are the most difficult to get constructed, um, that they're going to get adequate concessions and we don't overemphasize, say, moderate income housing uh, when it comes to providing incentives. So we're going to be working on these bills over the next few weeks um, as they move in the assembly and the Senate. Next slide. Um, here are a couple of other bills. There's actually three. I'm not really going to get into the ins and outs necessarily of each one of these, but here, the first two are AB 3107 by Senator or Bloom. Um, it really, this is all about requiring cities to allow um, housing to be constructed in commercial and retail zones. Um, this is something that many, many of our cities already allow in, in, their, in their jurisdictions. Certainly, you know, residential uses can be an allowable use in particular commercial and retail zones. Um, this in 3107, there's a certain requirement of 20% of the units to be affordable. Um, so it's basically a state overlay that'll go over top of our zoning and say, hey, cities, you have to allow this to be used there. Um, you know, again, we have a, a watch position on this one. We are seeking amendments and we're seeking amendments on the, on the, the 13 ASV 1385, which is the, uh, you know, it's the uh, Caballero bill, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Very similar um, concept, same state overlay. The thing that we want to make sure that we protect, though, is that while it may not be objectionable to allow residential uses in these commercial and retail zones, we have to ensure that cities have the ability to maintain those areas as commercial uh, and retail so we can generate TOT and sales tax and all the other things that we need to generate in order to provide services in our city to support all of that housing. So we're trying to find that right balance of, you know, of having it as an allowable use, um, but making sure that if a city doesn't want to allow that development to occur in that uh, commercial and retail zone that the city can go ahead and up zone somewhere else in their community to accommodate that development so they can maintain um, that core area for commercial uses and generate that sales tax. Um, SB 1299 is actually a really good bill from uh, Senator Portentino, which we are very much in support of. Um, basically, it would greatly incentivize rezoning of idle retail sites, commercial zones, um, those that are underperforming. And basically, it would provide, um, you know, additional dollars to cities um, to, to go ahead and convert those into residential uses, it would offset basically the loss of those sales tax and TOT. Um, so it's a great way of, of encouraging it. Um, there's no appropriation in it right now. Um, hopefully there'll be some money in there, but we strongly support that incentive approach where cities are gonna essentially be made whole as they convert that retail or commercial um, into housing and we'll get that additional backfill from the state. Um, next slide. 
Okay, so SB 1385 that I mentioned a second ago, um, this is part of the, the Senate's housing package. It's getting a, a lot more attention. Again, it, it's that overlay within those commercial and retail zones. We've been negotiating amendments with the author and the pro tem's office. Um, I'm hopeful that we're going to get to a spot where we're going to we're going to be okay on this. I mean, I think again, the the biggest issue we have is ensuring that our cities have the ability to protect their commercial and retail zones, to generate those dollars that we need to provide services. And as long as we can move that housing somewhere else in our community, it might be something that we can we can actually do. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll get to a position uh, where we'll be okay with the measure. Next slide. Okay, so AB 3040 by Assembly Number Two. This is a, a really good bill in that um, you know we definitely support the concept. We're we're trying to to negotiate um, a, a little bit better deal on this. But basically, what what Assembly Number Two is trying to do is for our cities that want to go ahead, and this is optional. You can do it if you want. But if a city wants to go ahead and upzone some of their single family areas to four acres per parcel and to create this buy right program, then we're gonna get arena credit for it. It'll make it easier for us to identify those sites in our housing element. And you know anything that we can do to make it easier for us to identify sites, we're certainly supportive of. Again, this is voluntary, it's not required. So if your jurisdiction wants to do this, there'll be a more smooth path with a little bit more certainty um, that if you do this upzoning, you're gonna get credit um, in your, your uh, site vacation within your housing element. The big issue that we're having is how much credit should we get? Is it, you know, if you up zone to four, are you going to get four units of allowable sites? They're not willing to go that far. That would be a fraction. I think they're looking at a 10th or maybe a, an eighth of, of, a, of a site. So we'd have to do for every 10, we get one full unit. Um, so we, we got to work on that, but the concept is a good one. Can, you know, encourage cities to up zone and make it easier for us to identify those sites in our housing element. So we're going to continue to work with the assembly member on this one, and hopefully we can get um, to a full support, but we certainly like the concept. Next slide. Okay, this is an interesting bill that, you know, kind of straddles Derek, uh, his area and my area, SB 474. Um, it just was amended, you know, maybe a week or 10 days ago, something like that. Um, this is kind of the extreme of, of what we're seeing. So basically, Senator Stern is saying, hey, if you're in a very high fire severity area, you cannot do any sort of building in those areas. No commercial, no retail, no industrial, and, and certainly no housing. So um, this is a, 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 I wouldn't even call it a companion measure, but it's certainly a, an alternative to SB 182 by Senator Jackson. Um, she has a bill that would basically just improve and enhance the standards that need to be met in order for development to occur in these very high fire severity zones. Um, it's still a path to development, but you have to have more hurdles and you have to be safer about it and have multiple entries, ingress and regress, that sort of stuff. This takes it to the other extreme and just says, hey, if you're in these very high fire areas, you can't do anything in those areas. I I'm not so sure that this bill is going to move. Um, I'm sure that the building industry is going to be, you know, really upset about it. Um, you know, I think from our city's perspective, it certainly would be a real challenge for us um, if we can't, particularly on the commercial side of things, if we can't, you know, generate additional retail and commercial uses in our community, that would be very difficult for us in order to then continue to provide the services that are needed for all the housing that we have in our communities. So we're keeping a watchful eye on this one, but I'm not overly convinced that it's, it's going to move very fast. Next slide. Okay, so we have a couple more bills here. Um, SB 1120, this is the bill that's probably going to get the most attention, I think, as it moves over into the to the assembly. Um, this is the Pro Tem Atkins bill. And, you know, she really owned the, the housing crisis, at least in the Senate, when SB 50 was killed. Um, she was on the floor, you know, telling her colleagues and all of us, and I was certainly listening, um, that the Senate was going to come up with a, an alternative to SB 50, a package of bills that will spur construction, uh, but do it in a more consensus approach. And, and I think this is her genuine effort of trying to come up with a, a way to increase housing density, to increase home ownership, um, but to do it in a way that's not going to mandate five or seven story buildings. And, and that was basically the exchange. Um, you know, she took off the table SB50 in those big buildings around transit and said, okay, fine, we're not going to do those big buildings now, but, you know, cities, you're going to have to allow for, you know, uh, duplexes on these single family lots. Um, and then you're, and you're gonna have to do it ministerially. You can add a duplex to an existing parcel. So you could bring it up to, to three units essentially. Um, but then you can also do a lot split and create two independent parcels where you can then add a duplex to the vacant portion of the parcel. Um, and then that can be sold off. So you can, you know, potentially increase home ownership. Um, went through our committee, went through our board. We have a supportive amended position on this bill. Again, we've been negotiating amendments, you know, with the author and, and, and with some of the other senators. Um, I'm hopeful that we're going to get to a place where, where we can support the bill. Um, it, it is certainly 
um, a, a much more you know nuance to, to how we need to increase density. The one thing that, that we're fighting most for is that we want to make sure that if you're going to add that duplex to an existing parcel, that you cannot add ADUs on top of it. That it's basically a maximum of three units on that parcel, much like the law requires us now. We can have the main house and two ADUs essentially. This would just replace those ADUs with a duplex. So um, that doesn't change the law a whole lot. So um, we're, we're hoping to continue to fight for that. Um, we certainly don't want to see single family lots get um, automatically zoned to say six or seven units. Um, that goes way beyond, I think, the intent of the bill. Um, so we're going to continue to work with the author and hopefully get to a, to a support position. Next slide. Okay, there are a couple of bills here in the homelessness sphere. I wanted to highlight AB 3300 by Santiago, Assembly Member Santiago. Um, this bill is, is a measure that's similar to SB 795 that I'm going to talk about a minute, in a minute that we are sponsors of with, with Senator Bell. Um, this bill essentially sets aside $2 billion annually, largely going to be funded through HCD, the Housing Community Development Department. But they're going to set aside $1.1 billion. Um, this is basically the HAP program. So this will go to counties and cities, or excuse me, sit counties and continuum of cares. That's where all of our cities can access these funds for homelessness prevention. Um, and then $800 million would be distributed to the cities over 300000 Just like the HAP program, it follows that exact formula. And then it would set aside $100 million a year for additional nonprofit housing um, development to occur. Um, we have a watch position on this bill. I mean, while we certainly support the dollars and would certainly support the bill, our preference is really SB 795. Um, and that's why you don't see a support on this bill for us. But um, if, if 795 were to go away or if the, the you know, stars align and this is the vehicle, uh, we would certainly support this, this the augmentation for sure. Next slide. So now to touch on 795. Some of you might remember SD5 from last year. That was a bill that we strongly supported. Uh, we were sponsors of last year with Senator Bell. It would have brought back tax increment financing. It would have certainly allowed the state to, to join us in the formation of, you know, an EIFD or a CREA. It would, it would have really, you know, allowed us to keep additional property tax so we could bond against it. It was a really great bill. We got it all the way to the governor's desk, and then he decided to veto it. Um, and, you know, and then now, you know, COVID hits and, and the, the, you know, purse strings are awfully tight. Um, so we had to reconfigure the bill. So this year, instead of it being that long-term 30-year commitment on additional property tax, um, this is really a $2 billion investment over five years. So it'll be $10 billion total. And it's going to go into those tried and true housing programs that we funded under the housing bond. It'll fund homelessness prevention activities in the HAP and HEAT program. And then we'll also fund two new economic development uh, uh, programs over in the governor's office of the business economic development or better known as GoBiz. Um, these would certainly help our communities recover. Uh, from, from this crisis that we're all facing, the pandemic, and it would also help prepare us better for natural disasters. So um, we're fighting hard for this bill. We're hoping that it's going to continue to move. It's on the, the Senate floor, um, and, and you know we strongly encourage everybody to, to support this bill. Um, with that, I believe that's my last slide, but if not, we'll see here. Um, I'd be happy to take any any particular questions. Oh, I, I'm too, I spoke too soon. I have two other homelessness bills, sorry. Um, ACA 10. Um, this is a constitutional amendment that has been around for a little while. Um, it basically declares a fundamental right um, to housing exists in this state. Um, there has, there's been a little bit of talk about it. It kind of fizzled out a bit, but this is something to keep an eye on if it actually occurs. Um, this is something I think we're going to want to uh, be really mindful of. Um, the other bill below it, AB 3269, this is another bill I think that everybody really needs to take a close look at. Um, we certainly have concerns with it. We've talked to the author's office about it. Um, it, this is a really big mandate on both cities and counties and the state, and it essentially will require our local governments to reduce homelessness by 90% uh, by 2028. Um, that's just right around the corner. And I know our cities are trying really hard to end homelessness, to tackle homelessness. And, and really the issue here is we need significant resources from the state. Not only do we need dollars from the state, a long-term commitment from the state, um, but we just need better tools at the local level as well. So, um, we're, we're not necessarily saying no entirely. I mean, this requires us to develop a plan on how we're going to close those gaps. Um, but the, the, the big question for us is, you know, it, it, it'll be very, very difficult for, for cities to be required to, you know, reduce homelessness by 90% and not have that adequate support from the state. So uh, we're certainly going to engage on this measure um, as, as, if it moves forward. Um, it did get out of the assembly. It's going to be over in the Senate. So we're, we're going to keep a watchful eye on this one. I encourage our cities to as well. And I think that might be the next slide. Next slide. That, yep, that is. So I know we don't have a question slide up just yet, but I do see some comments in the Q&A. So I think I'll go ahead and take some of these right now. while it's all kind of fresh in our minds. Um, let's see here. 
There was a question about how many bills um, are, are left. Um, you know, we, we could run the numbers. I, I want to say it's in the it's in the low 400s ish area. Um, we can certainly run the the, the list. Um, we could have one of our analysts do it. Maybe we could get it by the end of the call. Um, but I think it's in like the 400 ish sort of range. Um, there was a question about Grayson's 1484. Um, still a slim possibility. Has it officially been tabled? Um, no, it has not been officially tabled. Technically, it's still alive. Um, I have had conversations with the Senate staff, um, a committee staff working on the bill. They haven't been given direction to set the bill. So if rules committee, you know, basically says they need to set it, then that, that'll be a, you know, uh, something to pay attention to. Um, so technically it's alive, but I mean, if it gets out of the Senate, um, it has to go back to the assembly because it's never been heard in its proper form in the assembly. Um, and I, I'm not so sure the assembly is gonna, gonna be all that excited about it since they killed all the other mitigation fee act bills. So while it is officially alive, I, I think it's probably um, not completely. Um, there's a question about affordability in SB 1120, which is Senator Atkins bill. Th that is correct. There, there, is, there is no requirement for affordability. I, I think the, the, the author um, you know, intends for the affordability um, to come basically from design that if you're going to, if you're going to take a lot um, that is, cause you have to have at least a, uh, you have to be able to create at least two 1200 square foot parcels in order to split it. So you need to have at least a, a 2,400 square foot, um, uh, uh, you know, parcel to begin with that the fact that it's going to be a smaller dwelling on a smaller lot, that's going to be, you know, split that that will in some way, you know, incentivize lower cost, but there are no deed restrictions. There are no requirements for affordability. Um, as the bill is currently drafted. Um, there was another question about lot splits in wealthy suburbs. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think if you are in a, in a wealthy suburb and you do have a vacant lot and you're going to split it, um, th those uh, those duplexes will, will sell for a much higher rate than they would in, in a community, um, uh, uh, you know, of lower you know, lower means. So um, that that is yeah certainly something to, uh, to 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 keep an eye on for sure. Um, there's also a question about. Um, SB 1138, the emergency shelters, the rezoning sites. Yeah, I believe that's the Senator Weiner bill. Um, yes, we are mindful of that bill. We're in conversations with the, the Senator's office on that one. We don't have an official position just yet. Um, I think one of the biggest changes in that bill that we have concerns with really is around the rezoning within one year. Um, I believe they, they require us to do it within one year instead of three years under existing law. Um, that, that's a real significant challenge. So um, we, we are mindful of it and, and are certainly uh, working on that measure as well. Uh, we do have a question about the likelihood of um, uh, 803269 going the distance. Um, you know, I, I always hate to try to, you know, handicap some of this stuff, but uh, I mean, it's a really big policy idea. Um, it's a very, very expensive policy idea that is full of unfunded mandates that um, the state is certainly going to probably have to backfill. I mean, it still would have to go to the to the state mandates commission, but it's very explicit in the requirements for local government and what we need to do. Um, I believe the, the the appropriations analysis pegged it at a pretty high cost. I can't remember exactly, but I mean, it was in the hundreds. Of, I think it was hundreds of millions. But that's not taking into account the activities that local government will have to take in order to provide shelter and housing for everybody uh, who may be homeless. So. Um, Given the uncertainty, I think in the economic times, I think it's going to be tough, but um, I think our cities need to be at the table talking to legislators about this. And I know we all want to do our part and we're more than willing to help tackle homelessness, but we have to have the resources. So we, we, you know, our cities are looking at $7 billion in counting and revenue shortfalls because of COVID. We really don't have the ability to, to spend significant amounts of money on homelessness um, or by ourselves. I mean, we, we dedicate funds, of course, but to, to meaningfully tackle the issue, we have to have state support. Um, so I, I think it's a, it's, it's a tall order. Okay, there's a question about, um, uh, we should, would we strongly encourage folks to support 3300? Uh, and yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I would, I would encourage folks to support 3300 and I would do 795. They're certainly not mutually exclusive. I think they're they're competing for dollars, right? So so you know we, we can't all win when it comes to the dollars, but I think the policies that each one of them are trying to institute, we strongly support. So I would certainly encourage our cities to to go ahead and 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 you know take positions and support on both of those. Uh, there's there's a uh, a question about a position on SB 999. I'm not sure about that bill. I don't I don't know if you mean 899. 
um, which is a, another Senator Wiener bill that's, that's dealing with um, development on religious institution property and um, private school property. Um, we do not have a position on that one right now. Um, it, it's similar to a couple bills in the past that we also didn't have positions on. Um, it, it, that bill limits the development to 100% affordable units on property that's currently owned by those two institutions. Um, you know, while we're not thrilled about it, um, as of right now, we haven't taken a position. Okay. Um, somebody, oh, I guess one of our regional managers um, chimed in and said that Assemblyman Grayson, uh, you know, has has indicated to her division that he was pulling the bill, um, and that would be 1485. That's good to hear. Thank you, Sam Kale, for that. Um, you know, I, I appreciate his his willingness to do that. Um, I'm certainly going to keep an eye on the file to make sure that doesn't get doesn't get set. Um, there's a question about um, fire, very high fire severity zones um, and 474. Yeah, so the, I mean, you, we have about 100, and Derek can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we have about 140 or so cities that are within very high fire severity zones. I believe SB 474 even can, even applies to state responsibility areas, which is even a larger area. So if you have a community much like Palos Verdes Estates that is entirely within that zone, um, that bill would essentially put the brakes on all development in your community, commercial, retail, industrial, and residential. Okay, there's a question about uh, 1397 and uh, does it allow parcels under 0.5 acres to count for RENA? Um, I, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, I, yeah, I can't remember off the top of my head. I'll have to double check that one and, and circle back with you. Um, okay, there's a question. We're almost done. There's only two more questions. So uh, there's another question about SB 999, the mobile home park residency rent control exemption. Yeah, that's something that we have not taken a position on. Uh, as many folks know, mobile home parks are highly regulated by the state, um, and, and we've, we've pretty much stayed out of that one, and I, and I don't anticipate us um, getting involved in that one. And now the final question uh, in the queue, what are the league's positions on SB 902 and 995 Atkins? Okay, so SB 902, that is a bill that we adamantly opposed when it was originally introduced. Um, it was amended a little while ago to be an opt-in only bill. So it took out the requirement to believe I, do, I believe to do fourplexes and residential zones. So really all that remains is this new opt-in program that would allow a city to uh, develop an ordinance to allow for up to 10 plexes in certain areas under certain conditions. And the carrot for cities is that if you do that upzoning, you're going to be exempt from CEQA. So we don't have a position on it. Um, if it, you know, we're, we're more than happy to have uh, the state, you know, provide us with additional tools if they want to give us exemptions from CEQA to do certain things. Great. Um, but since it's optional, since it's opt-in, we're we're not going to take a position on it. Um, we'll let our cities decide if they want to use it or not if it becomes law. And then finally, the last question about SB 995. I believe that is the CEQA expediting bill um, that's also part of the housing package, if my memory serves. Um, this would bring down the the 270 day judicial review up, uh, you know, expediting that process from I think a hundred million dollar project down to a $15 million project. Um, again, we, we don't have a position on that. Um, you know, as lead agencies, we, we we try to shy away from some of the CEQA exemption bills or or the or the streamlining bills. Um, but, you know, we certainly, again, it's optional for the developer, for the city to choose to go into that. Um, so at this point, we, we do not have a position on that bill. Okay. Well, thank you very much for all of those questions. I hope I answered those. Uh, if you have more, just type them on in. And now I'm going to go ahead and hand it on over to Charles Harvey, who's going to walk through the public safety slides. Thank you all very much. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Jason. And uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, so public safety, we'll, we'll just dive right in. I uh, have a lot to cover today. So starting with, with cannabis enforcement, uh, notably there remains an emphasis here on this issue. Uh, a couple of bills in particular here that should be pleasing to cities and that they speak to the ongoing concern uh, that the illicit marketplace continues to thrive. So trying to do something about that. Uh, AB 2122 seeks to expand current law uh, by authorizing local government agencies to impose a civil penalty on persons who aid and abet unlicensed commercial cannabis activity uh, of up to $30,000 per violation. You know, under the bill for any city who brings an action against unlicensed an unlicensed cannabis operator, uh, the penalty collected will first be used to reimburse that city attorney or city prosecutor for the cost of investigating and bringing the action uh, with any remainder to be deposited in the general fund. So uh, relatedly, uh, Assembly Bill 3330 by O'Donnell 
uh, seeks to tighten up the advertising mechanisms on commercial cannabis. And so here are many online platforms, again, they just don't check the license status of those uh, that they promote. And so when they do, um, you know, many, many who do not check the legitimacy of the license credentials, uh, you know, that were provided. So, uh, you know, this allows illegal operators to sell products directly to consumers without proper regulation and really advantages those illicit operators over the legal retailers who, you know, go through, um, you know, who really undertake the expense of following those state and, and local regulations. So, uh, recent amendments to this bill actually removed the civil penalty reference and, and specific enforcement authorization uh, that was initially given to local government officials, but uh, those are actually covered under AB 2122. Um, and so, you know, AB 3330, AB 30, you know, would just explicitly prohibit a person from collecting uh, a fee or any form of compensation uh, for advertising or marketing the sale of, of unlicensed cannabis products. So uh, it would also deem uh, those actions a public nuisance. Uh, and the league, you know, remains in strong support of both of these bills. Uh, next slide. So we have a couple of bills of note pertaining to, to firearms, specifically gun violence restraining orders. And starting with AB 2617 by Assemblymember Gabriel, uh, this bill really seeks to do uh, three things. I mean, first, it states that any person who owns or possesses a firearm or ammunition uh, with knowledge that they are prohibited from doing so because of a a valid order uh, issued by an out-of-state jurisdiction that's similar or equivalent to what California deems a gun violence restraining order, uh, that, that person would be guilty of a misdemeanor. Uh, second, the bill would prohibit a person convicted of this misdemeanor from owning or possessing a firearm or ammunition uh, for a five-year period uh, beginning, on, beginning upon the expiration of, of the existing out-of-state order. And then finally, the measure would clarify that, that a law enforcement officer who requests a temporary restraining order, temporary emergency uh, GVRO must file a copy of that order with the court uh, within three, three days uh, after, after issuance. Uh, so the, the league adopted a support position for that bill last month. Um, AB 2532 by Irwin, it's really a straightforward measure that would simply add a district attorney, a county council and city attorney to the list of persons authorized to request the issuance or renewal of a gun violence restraining order. Um, and so, uh, that, uh, you know, that's something that now that we have confirmation, Assemblymember Irwin is moving forward uh, with this bill for the year. Um, she's been a conscientious and reliable partner for the league. We're, we're just awaiting uh, confirmation from our city attorney's department for whether we have the green light uh, to formally engage on that bill. Uh, next slide. Okay, so moving on to use of force. Uh, these, the next several bills uh, that I'm going to talk about uh, were, were introduced just within the last couple of weeks, really, in response to, to recent events. Uh, involving police use of force, uh, civil unrest, and, and racial bias against persons of color. So uh, beginning with Assembly Bill 66, this measure would establish clear standards on, on the use of rubber bullets and uh, what is deemed other less lethal weapons by law enforcement uh, for crowd control purposes. Uh, kinetic energy projectiles, you know, which are, which are rubber bullets, uh, also referred to as, as kinetic impact projectiles, um, in addition to, to chemical agents such as pepper spray and tear gas uh, are commonly used by law enforcement for crowd control. Um, these are deemed less lethal weapons compared to live bullets. Uh, and these uh, kinetic energy impact projectiles rather include, you know, like I said, rubber bullets, beanbag rounds, and, and foam rounds. Uh, so specifically, this bill would prohibit the use of these projectiles and chemical agents uh, by law enforcement on protesters who simply violate uh, an imposed curfew or whether they, you know, make perceived verbal threats uh, or demonstrate other mere noncompliance uh, with a law enforcement directive. Uh, the bill would also require the collection of data on the use of and, and any resulting injuries from, from the use of these less, less lethal weapons. And uh, the bill actually altogether would prohibit the use of tear gas uh, by law enforcement. So, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, these are, of course, in, in response to, to the recent civil unrest. And so, uh, you know, we'll be engaging on this bill and, and, and um, you know, working with our law enforcement partners to see uh, what makes the most sense in moving forward. Uh, AB 1196, you know, in, in direct response to the George Floyd killing by Minneapolis police, you know, uh, this bill is a straightforward measure that would ban law enforcement agencies in California from authorizing the use of the carotid artery restraint uh, or any chokehold when detaining suspects. This is already the policy for the majority of municipal police departments uh, in California. And so uh, the police chiefs actually are, are in strong support of that bill. Um, next slide. 
AB 96 actually was a nice segue in, into this bill I'm about to talk about. Um, AB 1314 by Assemblymember McCarty would require municipalities to annually post on their internet website specified information relating to the use of forced settlements uh, and judgments, um, including those amounts paid, broken down by individual settlement and, and judgment, uh, and premiums paid for insurance uh, against use of forced settlements and judgments. Um, and, and information on, on bonds used to finance those payments. So, uh, you know, looking at this bill, clearly the author wants to shine a spotlight on, on the amount of monies that cities pay out, uh, perhaps as, I guess as a motivating tool to curb incidents of excessive force. You know, with the national discussion unfolding um, over whether cities should quote unquote defund the police or, or see how they can reimagine their police departments through workable uh, but, but meaningful reforms. I mean, this proposal raises the question of whether shining, you know, a spotlight on, on the amount of monies paid out for these judgments and settlement claims, you know, is, is a bold and sensible change that would actually help curb the number of excessive force incidents or what, or would otherwise, whether it would otherwise produce, you know, unintended consequences such as uh, motivating persons to somehow induce police violence, you know, merely for a payday. So, I mean, this bill was just made public about 48 hours ago and we're still trying to wrap our arms around it. Uh, so, you know, stay tuned. We'll definitely have more um, in the weeks to come. But uh, moving on to the next slide. AB 1506 by McCarty uh, seeks to do a few things. First, uh, the bill would establish an independent division within uh, California Department of Justice to investigate incidents of officer-involved use of force that resulted in the death of a civilian. Um, and those, those, uh, those investigations, those independent investigations would occur only upon the request from a local law enforcement agency or, or district attorney. Uh, the bill would also authorize the Department of Justice to criminally prosecute, you know, any officer should such force be found to, to be unwarranted. Um, so strong systems and policies really, uh, you know, that encourage the use of an independent prosecutor uh, for reviewing incidents of deadly force and, and authorize the prosecution of inappropriate deadly force um, and in-custody deaths can, you know, can, can help promote, I guess, transparency needed to build mutual trust uh, between law enforcement and the communities they serve. This bill, you know, by authorizing police departments and district attorneys to make that request of DOJ, um, you know, of their independent review of an officer's use of force, it balances the premise of a department's local control with, with the community's desire for, for more transparency and oversight. Uh, this is another bill that the police chiefs uh, are in strong support of. Uh, next slide. Okay, so turning now to recent legislation that touches on racial bias, uh, AB 1472 by Assemblymember Stone uh, would specify that making a false report to the police, knowing that it is false or, or with reckless dis disregard to its truth, uh, constitutes, quote, an intimidation by threat of violence, end quote, under the Ralph Civil Rights Act. Uh, so, you know, additionally, this measure would specify that a person who makes a report in violation of, of the Ralph Act is, is prohibited from raising uh, what are called con privileged communications as a defense and would thereby allow for civil actions um, or would sub be, you know, would subject that person to sub be, be subjected to, to civil actions, even if the false report uh, was not motivated by, by bias against uh, a protected characteristic. So, you know, there have been many highly publicized examples of, of unnecessary or patently false calls to law enforcement uh, that, in particular, that threaten people of color. And so some recent examples include um, an incident in, in New York where, I believe, Amy Cooper is her name, who falsely claimed that that a black man was threatening her life after he requested that she follow park rules about, about leashing her dog. Uh, there was an incident in Oakland where um, uh, a white woman who requested police response to a black family who was, who was barbecuing at a lake out there. And so these, these acts you know, really weaponize the police and they, they endanger lives and simply pile on uh, to uh, what Wenny believed to be you know, over-policing that so often occurs in, in black and brown communities. Uh, next slide. So similar to the previous bill, AB 1550 would authorize a person to, to bring civil action against any responsible party uh, who motivated by a person's protected status knowingly causes a peace officer to encounter that person with the intent uh, to infringe upon uh, his or her rights or cause him or her to feel harassed, humiliated, or embarrassed. Uh, so this measure, again, it, this would outline actually, this measure takes it a step further than, than the previous measure. It outlines the various types of damages that a prevailing plaintiff who suffers harm as a result uh, may recover from a responsible party. Um, and you know, it also makes a false report 
that is deemed, uh, it would make a false report that is deemed a hate crime, uh, you know, punishable as a misdemeanor or, or, fen or felony. Um, so, you know, these two bills, this one and, and the previous one, uh, you know, there's, there's certainly some overlap there, but uh, clearly the legislature is trying to uh, comprehensively address so many of the issues that have surfaced over the last few weeks um, in the wake of, of all the civil unrest. Uh, so we'll, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, so I'm happy to entertain questions. There's actually one other bill, um, important bill that I'm going to mention that's not on this slide deck because it was just introduced yesterday, but I think it is important enough to just to warrant a mention, and that is uh, Senate Bill 731 by Senator Bradford. And this bill principally does two things. First, it would disqualify a person from being employed as a peace officer if that person has been convicted of uh, or has been, you know, adjudicated in an administrative military or civil judicial process um, as having committed a violation of certain crimes, including the falsification of records, bribery, or perjury. So, um, you know, it really tackles that uh, officer decertification uh, component that that uh, a lot of people are looking for. You know, with regard to to officers who who have some some criminal misconduct or, or other misconduct in their past. Uh, second, SB 731, with the exception of individual attorneys. Uh, acting on behalf of a prosecutor's office, uh, you know, the bill would remove qualified state immunity for any cause of action brought against an employee um, or agent of a public entity uh, or directly against uh, a public entity. So again, this measure was just introduced yesterday um, and, you know, still uh, a lot of questions that have yet to, to get in touch with the author's office about this, but, um, you know, while I could see the provisions surrounding officer de decertification uh, could be um, you know, negotiated and fairly easily. I imagine pretty much every law enforcement entity will have huge problems with the provisions that eliminate qualified immunity uh, for peace officers and, and departments at large. So, you know, again, we'll be actively monitoring and engaging on, on many of these bills, um, you know, certainly after legislators return from, return to the Capitol from their summer recess. Uh, but that's about all I have for now. Happy to entertain any questions, um, you know, but uh, otherwise I will turn it over to my colleague, uh, Nick Romo to discuss revenue tax. Charles, you have one question you want to take that now or you want to wait? Um, so let's see. Yeah, so okay, question, when are all the positions on these public safety related bills with pending uh, going to be determined? So yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, I would say within the next within the next few weeks we'll have uh, you know with, certainly within the next couple of weeks we'll have more clarity as to uh, positions positions that we can engage on based on policy uh, existing organizational policy and and other guidance uh, from from membership and so um, you know it, it's it's probably going to be you know certainly before the end of July um, we'll have clarity on those bills that we can formally engage on and those that uh, that we'll leave alone. And that's that's it. All right. Well, uh, good uh, brunch hour, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Nick uh, Romo. I'm your revenue and taxation uh, lobbyist here. I was also your senior fiscal and policy analyst prior. Um, you know, as you know, we, we started this year, as, as Mal, you mentioned uh, way in the beginning, we started this year in the land of riches, uh, a great state budget surplus. Um, our our lo local revenues uh, uh, statewide, um, as it is, uh, was doing uh, uh, pretty well, uh, and we were going into sort of a, another sort of uh, another uh, good year uh, of, of revenues. And, and and the reason why I bring that up now is um, in those good years, as you know, uh, legislators come up with with fantastic ideas on how to change uh, things and, and how to spend uh, their money or, or, or other folks' money. Um, so going into this year, we had several uh, new measures that would provide uh, you know, broad tax exemptions, sales tax exemptions, uh, business license uh, fee exemptions, things that are like that we uh, we see typically um, you know, each and every year in the legislature that every year the league um, has to uh, uh, bring come in with the with the calm voice and say you know uh, when you do these sorts of things, these tax credits and things like that, or tax exemptions that. Um, erode the, uh, particularly the sales tax base, um, you're doing everyone a disservice. So we, we walked into a very familiar year and then COVID-19 of course hit 
Of course, as you know well, you, you may have heard from me at nauseum about the seven plus billion dollars of revenue general, general revenue shortfall that we all that we are all experiencing. And I'm sure that number is already beginning to become out of date um, as we move into the summer months and we are now oscillating between open and closed. And so uh, just giving you the picture of where we are and uh, given your feedback or use of the survey, use of the data, uh, many of the measures this year that would have been harmful to cities um, in, in terms of our revenues um, have been held uh, held back. So we'll go to, we just have a couple of bills um, at this juncture and then I'll give you some, some preamble potentially into what we may see in the summer, but especially as we go into next session, um, as we think about um, and knock on wood that we're in a place next winter, next you know, early winter, that we're, we are all in a place uh, uh, where we can really focus on recovery. So just very quickly, just a couple of bills are still alive that are of interest to us. Um, AB 2570 Stone uh, is a measure that, that extends the whistleblower protections that are in place for false, false tax claims to the revenue taxation code. And why is this important for cities is that this will now cover actually the sales and use tax law. Uh, currently, uh, under current law, your your DA, um, the state AG, uh, Attorney General, that is, uh, cannot uh, take into account a whistleblower's claim that a, a corporation or company is uh, defrauding a, a local government uh, of sales tax support. So this measure would do that, essentially provides whistleblowers that protection uh, it also gives uh, you a significant amount of, of leverage and leeway to decide whether you want to take these cases, what information you want to share, um, if it is confidential tax information. So uh, we do support this measure. We think um, that, uh, especially in these times, uh, you know, there's no room for um, widening the tax gap that, that already exists in terms of the amount that we are owed and the amount that's actually collected. So we're talking about fraud here. Uh, we're not talking about um, uh, you know, uh, simple mistakes or honest mistakes. We're talking about uh, fraud that is being backed up by uh, significant and, and uh, laudable claims uh, by whistleblowers. So we do support that measure. It's in the second house, uh, and we'll see how it fares. Next slide, please. Uh, SB 1441, this is in the category of bills uh, that was determined very early on um, after COVID-19 hit. Uh, a category of bills, which was, um, does this bill need to actually happen this year? And that was a big um, indicator uh, for the legislative leadership uh, as to what bills to, to hold and what bills to move forward. SB 1441 is actually a critical bill that needs to be passed this year to allow locals who do levy a EUT on the prepaid mobile wireless uh, cards and accounts that you can buy at a corner store or Target and things like that for prepaid wireless services. Um, the law, you know, we, we got um, trapped up in a number of court cases that affected the state. Uh, it's the same sections affected the local agency. The courts decided to separate the issue and, and uh, locals are still in the clear to assess the, you know, the, the tax. Uh, but as part of that, over the last couple of years, you'd have to patch this together. And so this bill, SB 1441 by Senator McGuire, essentially is extending indefinitely our ability to uh, le uh, levy the UT on prepaid mobile wireless. If it does not go through, the, the, the law does have a um, <clears throat> December 31, 2020 uh, um, so sunset. And so we do need to get this uh, done this year. We are support and we'll be sending out support letters and those for, I believe it's 105 cities to date, maybe a plus or minus uh, cities that, that do uh, assess this. Uh, tax. Next, next slide, please. Uh, two measures, uh, one on investments, uh, SB 998 by Senator Morlock uh, is a measure, uh, a lot going on in this bill, but uh, in, in essence, it provides parity for all cities uh, with the largest cities in the state who um, have more leeway as to the amount uh, of their surplus funds that they can invest uh, in, in the market, as well as of the vehicles that they can invest in. And so currently the law is bifurcated between some of our larger cities in the state and our smaller medium cities, medium sized cities. Uh, so this measure brings that parity. Uh, you know, this measure's been kind of moving along. Uh, we, we, we weren't sure that it would continue on this year, but it looks like it will. Uh, so the region of watch position, we don't have any concerns with the measure. 
the bill does have sunsets on some of the uh, major changes so that uh, we can continue to watch whether they whether they are working. A big issue at hand right now is uh, it relates to negative interest accrual um, that some banks will start actually, the folks are worried that banks will actually start charging folks to hold their money. And so uh, the, the question at hand here is whether or not cities, uh, the better alternative is to be able uh, to handle that themselves. And so as long as they keep those securities to maturity. So it's, it's quite in the weeds, uh, but we, we expect to uh, move to a support position. We'll continue to watch that, but expect a support position on that to provide some parity for folks. And again, it has a sunset, so if, it does, if things uh, are not working out with that, uh, we can uh, reimagine what's going on there. SB 1049 Glazer uh, is related to short-term rentals. And a little background here for you, and uh, if we have folks on from the city of Orinda, uh, Senator Glazer, and uh, Senate member of uh who uh, represents uh, the city and the East Bay area, um, are responding to an incident that happened in the city of Orinda at an Airbnb rental uh, in which it was rented out for an innocuous one bedroom, a uh, couple day stay um, uh, in the city, but turned out to be a, a large ha Halloween party, uh, uh, colloquially referred to as a rager. Um, and uh, and I'll stop there with the with the flippancy on that uh, because uh, at that party uh, five people uh, w were shot and killed um, and it has raised questions about the laws that are in place uh, that allow cities to uh, essentially penalize and to regulate short-term rentals. So as you can imagine, after the incident, lots of, of, of thoughts on how to fix uh, how to prevent those things from happening. So SB 1049 uh, would authorize a, a general law city to impose a fine up to $5,000 for a violation of short-term rental, of the local short-term rental ordinance. It's actually an escalated uh, fee, uh, fine structure that's being put in place. And the reason why we're at a watch and we certainly su uh, support the, the senator's uh, extension of, of our authority to continue to crack down on um, short-term rentals that are, are not following the laws and, and pose a public health risk. Uh, we continue to work with the, the author uh, on the language around what, what are serious violations and what are ministerial violations. Uh, we hope to come to a, con uh, to a resolution uh, with the author. We think uh, his heart's in a good place, and obviously the policy's in a good place. Uh, we're just trying to figure out, uh, make sure that cities continue to have the ability to um, uh, regulate short-term rentals at, at, a, at the local level, and no uh, sort of authority is conceded, conceded on that. And so uh, please watch out for that bill. You'll be hearing uh, from me on that. Uh, hopefully, not too much. Hopefully, we can work with the author, get that done, and, and provide the cities a new tool uh, to continue to make sure that um, they're operating safely. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a slide put into my section so that the folks who are listening on the on kind of the HISP officer lens on SB 217, we talked about it. On um, this, you know, late breaking bill, um, but it has lots of issues in it uh, related to our fees and uh, you know again in the milieu of the kind of the context of the fact that um, parks and rec programs at, at city level uh, uh, it are are going to take a significant hit this year uh, from our, our budget standpoint and in conversation with our special district uh, you know who run uh, parks uh, parks districts and the recreational districts they're certainly uh, facing the same pinch so this still may be uh, uh, a bigger problem this year than maybe in other years. Next slide, please. And then, uh, and I put this bill last, and I just wanted to uh, give you a preamble of this. This is a bill, AB 398 by Canton 2, uh, out, of Los, out of Los Angeles County. I essentially uh, introduced a bill uh, with uh, a, a new a statewide head tax. And you may have, have heard of this, uh, a number of uh, cities have have considered doing this. I, I believe there's maybe one in operation in the state in the city of Mountain View um, that has, has just begun to um, implement that this year. Um, you know, we, we do have concerns about taking a local tax statewide, bringing a local tax that would otherwise be a local tax into the jurisdiction on CDTFA, uh, where we have not really explored all of the issues that, that can be conveyed there. Um, also concerned about, you know, taking the decision out of your hands, a number of cities again, have considered this whether or not it's the best thing to do for their for, for their city, considering their their business uh, relationships, considering the the structure of their economy, the sh 
and, and the shape and health of their local economy, whether a head tax would be appropriate. But uh, the reason why it's on watch position and there's no movement on this bill is uh, we do believe this is part of, uh, uh, I think the uh, part of the legislature, especially those that have, have um, you know, some of our interests in, in mind, uh, trying to put out new proposals uh, for tax uh, revenue generation, uh, particularly as we go into the summer months before we, before and after we learn about the July 15 income tax receipts that the, that the state will be receiving, uh, as well as again into next year, uh, as we begin to think about recovery and filling uh, budget gaps. Of course, um, the federal government will play a huge role in whether or not they they uh, send uh, uh, state and local assistance. So all to say, uh, we think this is a preamble for discussion. The league is as well positioned to begin to, to to be part of these conversations. We have done our homework over the years on a number of, of tax proposals and revenue generation proposals, plus and minus for cities. Um, and so we're, we're part of this conversation, of course, in partnership with labor and other business that are talking about this and of course the state. Um, so no red alarms to get on AB 398. Uh, you'll be hearing from me if there are, uh, but I just wanted to give you a sense or a taste of uh, what potentially is, is to come uh, over the next year. And uh, we'll continue to um, uh, continue to really analyze the impact of these. Of course, we'll rely on our revenue taxation policy, our fiscal officer, city managers, and the like. So uh, feel free to reach out to me if you'd like to chat. I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of the above. I believe that's the end of my uh, presentation. I'll turn it over to Caroline. Unless there's immediate questions, I can look at the Q&A. Um, I don't think there's any immediate questions for me. Thanks, Nick. Um, as Nick mentioned, my name is Caroline Cerencioni. I'm the um, legislative analyst at the League that covers transportation, communications, and public works issues. Um, before I get started, I'm just I'm happy to say that some of our largest opposition bills in this portfolio this year that you might have heard me talk about before are actually no longer moving forward. And this includes AB 2168 McCarty, which would have created a 15-day permit shot clock for EV charging and then AB um, 3116 Irwin, which sought to limit the types of data local governments could receive from scooter providers. Um, so neither of those bills are moving forward this session and most of the bills that I'll talk about today are actually supports. So I'll start with mobility devices. I'm actually gonna go in opposite um, order. I'm gonna start with AB 1286. This is a two-year bill that the league is actually co-sponsoring with the Consumer Attorneys of California. We've been meeting with the consumer attorneys and Marisucci's office recently and have confirmed that we're going to be continuing to try and move this bill forward this session. We think that the bill is still pertinent during COVID-19 because we've really started to see some of these scooters up and operational again in some of our cities. Um, the bill lays out some common sense protections for riders of micro mobility devices, such as prohibiting shared mobility device providers from waiving the legal rights and remedies of their users in user agreements, and also requires the industry to maintain general liability insurance coverage. In addition to these user protections, the bill will also require device providers to have prior authorization from the jurisdictions that they wish to operate in prior to deploying any kind of these scooters or e-bikes, um, either through local ordinance or agreement. Um, we think this last part is really important as we've seen scooter, scooter companies dump large amounts of these devices without any notice or warning, creating issues related to enforcement um, and equal and equitable distribution of services. So AB 1286, it's really consistent with our ideology that cities should be able to make these decisions if they want these devices operating in their communities or not. Turning back to AB 326, um, this bill is related to motorized carrying devices, and the bill defines these as electric-powered self-propelled devices meant to transport a person's property. Um, these devices are controlled wirelessly by a person within the immediate facility of the vicinity of the device, and they can be as large as the average person, weigh up to 85 pounds, and go as fast as 8 miles per hour. Um, AB 326 will authorize these devices to operate on city streets and sidewalks statewide. It's the league's position that allowing these devices to operate statewide might be the wrong approach. 
Um, we're kind of handling this similar to how we've handled our micromobility issues, um, where we prefer that these device providers seek prior authorization from um, the cities that they wish to operate in through local ordinances or agreements um, prior to deploying these devices within the public right of way. So we have written an opposition letter for this bill, but we're going to try to coordinate with Marisucci's office first since we are working so closely with them on AB 1286. Next slide. So next I'm going to touch on some emergency telecommunications bills. The first is SB 431 McGuire. This bill requires the uh, California Public Utilities Commission and the Office of Emergency Services to develop and implement performance reliability standards for cell towers and other mobile telephone service infrastructure in tier two or tier three high fire threat districts. And these standards would establish minimum operating life for backup power systems of no less than 72 hours and develop ways to warn customers when that backup power system is low or when a transceiver can no longer be supported by the backup power system. We think that this bill is really a step in the right direction, ensuring that residents and local emergency responders can have access to telephone service during an emergency and are able to continue to receive critical information and alerts. Um, of note on this bill, uh, the California Public Utilities Commission also has recently issued a proposal that would similar, similarly propose 72 hour backup power for wireless facilities in the same high fire threat districts. Um, they're currently accepting public comment for that proceeding, so I'm happy to send that around if anybody is interested. Next slide, please. SB 794 Jackson is another support bill, and it's actually a reintroduction of SB 46 Jackson from last year, which the League also supported. This bill will authorize cities to enter into agreements with their social services departments and or public utilities to utilize their records to automatically enroll residents into um, a city operated public emergency warning system. This is a capability that counties already have. Um, so this would be simply extending us the same authorization. Uh, but the bill actually takes it a step further and it also authorizes county social services departments to disclose the telephone number and the email address of vulnerable individuals that are receiving services um, to police, fire and paramedical personnel in the event of a public safety emergency that necessitates a possible evacuation. Um, existing law already requires for the disclosure of these individuals' names and addresses, um, but SB 794 would expand this to also include this critical contact information that would make it easier to reach out to these individuals in the event of an emergency. Next slide. SB 865, another support bill. Um, it seeks to safe, strengthen safe excavation practices by increasing collaboration between excavators and operators, requiring data sharing among key stakeholders and moving the dig safe board to the Office of Energy Infrastructure Safety, which will better align with the board's mission and operational functions. Specifically, this bill requires regional notification centers, which um, provide warnings of excavations near subsurface installations to share damage reports within five days to the Dig Safe Board and provide quarterly reports on all notifications. Um, additionally, this bill will require operators to map new subsurface installations with GIS coordinates beginning in 2021. We think that these are just some really common sense changes that will only continue to protect the critical underground infrastructure that runs through all of our communities. Next bill, please. SB 1130 is related to broadband infrastructure. The league is currently in support. Um, this bill would expand the California Advanced Services Fund program to encourage deployment of 21st century ready communications. Um, the bill would provide that the goal of the California Advanced Services Fund is to approve funding for infrastructure projects that will provide high capacity, future-proof infrastructure to unserved areas or unserved high poverty areas. Um, SB 1130 will also raise the minimum standards for what constitutes broadband service, requiring broadband networks funded by this state to be high capacity and ensuring that this funding is not going to any sort of low service infrastructure. Additionally, SB 1130 will make it easier for local governments to apply for these grants. Previously, local governments 
could only apply if the CPUC had an open application process and no other entities applied. Um, now cities would be eligible um, if, they have one of, if they have a project within one of these unserved areas. I think COVID-19 has really highlighted um, the need to address broadband infrastructure in this state as communities who thought they were well equipped um, have really struggled to stay connected to school and work and healthcare. Um, at the last league board meeting, we actually adopted new broadband policy, which would support additional funding and resources to provide access to high speed broadband infrastructure and close the digital divide in unserved and underserved communities. So SB 1130 closely aligns with these goals and we'll continue to be supporting this one moving forward. Um, in recent conversations with the CPUC, they've highlighted that there might be other bills later this session that seek to um, increase the amount of funding available under the California Advanced Services Fund. So we're gonna keep our eyes out for that as well, um, but they were pretty on board with most of the changes included with SB 1130, which is a step in the right direction. Next bill. Uh, AB 2421, the league currently has a neutral position on this bill. We were able to get some amendments that alleviated our original concerns and I know that backup power for telecoms is a really hot issue. So I just wanted to make sure this bill remains on your radar and to let you know we're tracking it closely. Um, the bill will create a 60 day deemed approved permit shot clock for emergency backup power within the physical footprint of a macro cell tower site. The argument in favor of this bill is cities need to move quickly to approve these applications to increase the deployment of backup power and ensure reliable telecommunications during the upcoming wildfire and PSPS season. While the league is definitely supportive of ensuring reliable telecommunications during emergencies, um, it is, we are a little wary of the permit shot clock. Um, because of this, we originally submitted a concerns letter citing the shot clock as a concern. Um, but the rural counties representatives of California, RCRC, they were able to secure an amendment which actually clarifies that local governments can revoke the deemed approved status of an emergency backup generator permit that's determined to violate any kind of state or local laws or regulations, including building and fire safety codes. Um, these amendments were not easy to get um, and definitely were a step in the right direction for this bill. Um, so we were able to go neutral with those. RCRC was able to move to support, I believe. So we're gonna to continue to monitor this bill closely for any kinds of future amendments and keep you updated on our position if it does evolve over the course of this session, um, but definitely wanna keep it on the radar. Next bill, please. AB 2730, I, I wanted to close highlighting this bill. I, I'm not sure yet if we're going to be taking a position or not, but it's definitely interesting in concept. We've been watching it closely um, and watching how it continues to evolve, especially since it's related to emergency management. Um, this bill requires regional transit districts, county transportation commissions, and other local transportation authorities upon the request of adjacent transit providers to permit the use of and compensation for um, paratransit vehicles and drivers for the event of an emergency which would require the evacuation or relocation of the access and functional needs population. It's an interesting bill that would allow for local partnerships, um, and resource sharing to evacuate some of our most vulnerable community members. We're definitely keeping a close eye on it. Um, we're maintaining our watch position for now, but um, if you have any specific interest on this bill or any of the other ones that I mentioned, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to talk more about them with you one-on-one. -on -one. And with that, I think that is the last bill. I'm happy to take any questions or if there are other questions for other lobbyists, we could address those now as well. I don't see any in the Q&A. It doesn't look like it. Melanie or Jason, back to you. Oh. Thanks, Caroline. Hey, everybody. Oh. Go ahead. Go right ahead. <laughs> Thank you. And then there is a question in the Q&A box about where SB 278, the status. Yes, I'm looking at that one now. I, it's looking like it's just passed over houses. It's in assembly transportation. We have a watch position on it right now. Um, it looks like it's just recently been referred. So we'll go back through and, um, and keep you up to date on that one going forward. Thanks, Caroline. Jason, any other comments? 
as we see if we get any nope. additional questions. Yeah, let's check the participants. I don't see any, I don't see any hands raised and no more questions in the Q&A. And same, perfect. Uh, we appreciate everyone taking time today from your really busy schedules. Um, again, we're happy that you're able to participate on this, knowing that it has been an interesting year for us um, and for all of you in working with the legislature and what we typically deal with, with, you know, 2,500 bills plus and that being, you know, reduced to under 500 at this point um, and really having it prioritized on how we're addressing COVID-19, our um, disaster preparedness, housing, homelessness, and public safety. Uh, if you have any questions of any of the lobbyists, don't hesitate to contact any of us. You'll see on the screen all our email addresses. Um, so please do contact us. We want to make sure you have the most up-to-date information as possible as your cities are considering taking action on these bills. Bills. So with that, I wish you a happy Wednesday afternoon. And again, thank you for your participation today.